<laughs> hey everybody, it's Matt Roth, Mike Vegas, and Deborah Silver Dickey. Uh, we are fair phones today because Erica, our producer, she is in Vegas for UFC uh, Ultimate Fighter Live finale. So, uh, Fair Bones Podcast, what's going on, everybody? I don't know why you're the one taking the, the host role there. I Man, I just, I just went with it. I, and I felt good doing it. I felt good. So, uh, uh, I, had a, I had a funny little thing just happen here. I had the, uh, the episode player up, and I can totally hear myself uh, five seconds ago. And, the future Fagan? Yeah, so so I'm here. Future Fagan's hearing pa- past Fagan, and Derek already dropped out twice. So yeah, everyone, if you're if anyone's listening, we're gonna have a great 15 minutes, hopefully here. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter. You can reach me at it's Mike Fagan, uh, Derek at Fightlinker Subbo, and Matt Roth at Matt Roth five one two. Um, you can also call into the show. Uh, I'm not even going to sure if I'm going to take calls if we do get them, but uh, the number should be on your screen, but it's 347-945-5612. And uh, let's get right into the uh, the MMA Hello. talk. Derek, you're, you're on the air. Don't, uh, Good. don't fuck us up here. Um, long cu- first time, long time. First time, first time. <laughs> long time listener, first time caller, Derek Subotiki. Uh Yeah, we don't really have those on this show. No, we don't. Well, we have a couple. We have a couple. Um, but UFC 146 is on Saturday. Uh, we'll get right into that. Uh, what did you guys think of the show uh, as a as a whole? And uh, we'll go from there. I enjoyed it. I thought that was a really, really good event. Um, granted, total fight time for the pay-per-view, for the, the heavyweights was something like 22 minutes total, which is kind of wild. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's what you should get with heavyweight fights. You shouldn't get boring, drawn-out decisions, as you saw in Yama Pit Fighting 1 or in uh, Pro V2. Derek? I, I also enjoyed the show. I was happy to uh, see that with that shortened fight time, we pretty much got to see every fight that was on the card, which uh, really hasn't happened since the uh, Lesnar Couture card. They showed everyone for that. And the whole thing was wrapped up in just a couple of hours, so even people on the East Coast that uh, are used to being around until 1 o'clock watching the pay-per-view got to cut out a little bit early. I think people enjoyed that. And there was good action. Like, there wasn't any of you know, those boring 15-minute slot fests that you'd see with, like, maybe, like, a Gonzaga versus uh, Shop. Like, you didn't see any of those kind of fights. I think Miocic uh, is a very interesting uh, prospect now at heavyweight, and everybody else kind of did what they were supposed to do. Yeah, I, I alluded to this, to this last week on the show. Um, I had a a party going on at my house. Uh, it was my roommate's birthday party. We had a bunch of people over, and it, I, and I said last week I thought it was a really good show to have on. Uh, you know, if there's going to be a UFC show on, it should be something like this, where it's it's five heavyweight fights, uh, and you know, I think we all expected them to, to end pretty quickly, and they did, which was uh, fantastic. And like you guys said, uh, you know, good action in all of them, uh, even in the Velasquez Silva fight, which was uh, one-sided. Even the, the Dos Santos Mir fight, which was one-sided, uh, it was still exciting enough, and uh, I think it kept everyone's attention at my party. Uh, the, the one thing that I, I said coming out of the main event, and I said this, and uh, you know, I should preface it with I had been drinking all night, um, but I, st- I rewatched the fight the next morning, and I still feel the same way. I thought after Frank Mir uh, tried to take Dos Santos down early in round one, uh, and Dos Santos... Uh, really did a great job defending it. Mir really committed to that first takedown. But I thought after that, um, I, I, I call him a, I, I said that he quit. And when I say that, I mean he mentally quit on, on the idea of winning. Uh, he seemed resigned to the fact that he was going to take a beating for, you know, eight to ten minutes, and then that was going to be it. Did you guys get that, that feeling too from Frank, or, or am I alone in that? Well, I personally didn't, and a lot of people try to ascribe that to uh, Frank as being a quitter. That's what Dos Santos was trying to plant during the prime time in the lead-up to the fight. And a lot of people were saying that versus Carwin that he quit. And I think that Carwin kicked his ass, and that's different than quitting in a fight when somebody is better than you and they just beat you down. I think Mir was game. He absolutely went in there with a game plan. I don't know if the game plan was to continue shooting and not to ever box. But like you said in the post-fight, knowing what to do and being able to do it are two different things. And I think that we just see Frank Mir's limits when he runs up against really just elite-level heavyweights. Well, I, I, th- I think with, with Mir, I don't want to call him a quitter because, I mean, he, he definitely is really highly decorated. 
he didn't clean against Nogueira when he probably could have. Um, so I don't want to call him a quitter. I think that, that you know, Derek is completely correct that um, but sometimes when he just faces guys who have crazy power, um, that that kind of power, it, it can break your, you know, break, break you. And uh, I, I think that maybe he, he didn't anticipate how hard uh, Junior Dos Santos hit. I believe uh, Shane Carwin actually said it uh, about Junior Dos Santos that you just can't train for how hard he, uh, he hit you and how fast his hands are. I, I think that, that maybe it's just a matter of his, uh, his entire game plan fell apart when he finally, when he, when he tasted uh, Dos Santos' power. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I... I don't want people to get the impression that I thought Frank uh, quit and just kind of gave up on the fight. I just thought when it, it was just a really deflating moment for him when Dos Santos uh, defended that takedown uh, early in the round. And I mean, Frank, like I said, he really committed to it. He, uh, you know, he gave Dos Santos a couple of yanks, and then when he when he yanked and he almost pulled himself into guard, you know, he, he stayed latched on to Dos Santos' leg, and Dos Santos was able to get out. The only other time Frank went for a takedown the rest of the fight. Uh, was towards the end of the first round when uh, it looked like Dos Santos might have been able to finish uh, with a few seconds left in the round, and he had Frank wobbled, and Frank just sort of uh, hail mary dived at his at his ankles, and uh, then the, the round mercifully ended for him. Um, but yeah, a, a really great performance for Junior Dos Santos. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I don't think there's any other way to describe what he did on Saturday night. Um, but in the co-main event. Um, the guy that DeSantos beat for the belt, uh, Cain Velasquez, came back and probably had as, as good of a, a performance he could have, have had uh, coming off of a loss and coming off his, his knee injury, uh, or his shoulder injury, I'm sorry. Um, the thing about that fight that kind of surprised me and it was kind of weird was uh, when they stopped the bout, when Rosenthal stopped the bout to get the doctor to check on Silva's cut, uh, it was pretty obvious that the cut was not only a, a bad cut, but it was in a bad spot. Uh, the doctor let it continue, and it looked like the cut, if anything, got worse after the doctor checked it, and then Rosenthal didn't make any attempt to, to restop it or recheck it. Um, am I the only one that thought that that should have been stopped at some point just due to the cut? Yeah, I mean, that, when, when, when blood is literally shooting out of the head, and, you know, when, when Antonio Silva is shaking his head off, uh, shaking, you know, blood off of his face like a dog, Takes off water out of its fur. I mean, you, you have to stop that fight. That, 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 that was an ugly, ugly fight. Um, I, I don't know if you saw this, but Antonio Silva's manager went to the underground and said that um, that, that, that he just hates uh, cuts because uh, he hates those because all they do is uh, cause cuts. Did you see that or no? I did not see that, but I mean that's a yeah. that's a long-standing argument of people who hate elbows. So it's a dumb argument. It's so stupid. I mean, we, we've seen in the past that elbows can stop fights. And I, and I would argue that the elbow that, that started it all was the one that landed the cut, that, that caused the cut. That didn't, you know, it, it was an, an accumulation of damage. Yeah, I mean, and it, it was pretty clear, I think, and this is kind of what most people thought the fight would look like going into it, was, uh, you know, Kane was just so much more faster on more faster, uh, so much faster, so much more athletic, and just sort of, I mean, took the fight to him right away. Um, I, I heard yeah. some things that, that Kane was pissed and, and that he kind of wanted to take it out uh, in this fight, and it looked like that's exactly what he did. Right. Well, I, I am still a little bit concerned about Velasquez dos Santos uh, for Velasquez's side in the rematch because if he comes in there and he wants to box, then he's probably going to get knocked out again. And it wasn't like he went out and immediately shot on a, on Bigfoot. Bigfoot threw a kick, and he caught it and pushed him down and then started the ground and pound. But if he doesn't throw that kick, he may have gone out there and tried to box with Bigfoot, and I still worry that he leans towards that a little bit too much. It's going to get him in trouble against Junior if he does it. Yeah, and to be fair, though, I mean, a guy like Silva is a guy I think he can afford to stand and, and strike with. Um, you know, I think the speed difference... Uh, I mean, and, and that's pretty much what the difference was for, for Fedor when Fedor was at his prime, was that he was just so much quicker and, and, and he, he had a lot of power still, um, being a smaller heavyweight, um, that he was able to, to leverage the speed to, to really uh, take guys out. Um, and you kind of alluded to a rematch. Is it pretty much a – I mean, I – and. Uh, I should say before the show went on air, there's there's rumors now that that Kane and Dos Santos are going to coach the next Ultimate Fighter, 
uh, obviously setting up a rematch. Is the rematch the way to go? Is that is that what people want to see? Is that what you want to see? I think oh, so. No. I, but d- simply because there really isn't a heavyweight right now with Brock gone and not really considering a comeback by all indications. There aren't a lot of heavyweights that you can name right now that make interesting fodder for Dos Santos that he hasn't beaten already. There aren't guys that are lining up in that contender's realm. So I think a rematch there makes sense because, I mean, really, who else do you have Velasquez beat up in the interim? Well, well I mean, what about Alistair over him? What about him? He's he's suspended until the end of the year, and at the end of the year he can only apply for a license. So at best he's looking at March or April. Yeah, but I mean, but wouldn't wouldn't he be the? I I don't know. I I, I like I like the idea of of Los Santos uh, Velasquez too, but I can't see it going differently than, than the first one. You know, it, I, I can if if Kane comes in with a different game plan. Like I said, I don't know if he wanted to stand in box with Bigfoot, but the first time he had a chance for that takedown, he took it about three seconds in. If he comes in shooting on Junior and closing distance as opposed to trying to go, you know, blow for blow with him, I think we could see a very different fight, at least one that lasts a little bit longer than a minute. I don't think he can get Junior down, though. Well, I, I, mean, I think that he'll that, definitely be the best wrestler that's ever tried. Gonzaga got Junior down for a split second, and Mir couldn't do it. But Velasquez is a little bit better of a wrestler than both those guys. Didn't didn't Carwin get him down momentarily as well, or am I misremembering something about that fight? I thought there was a moment where he, I mean, it, he got right back up, if I remember. But I thought he took him it's down. It's possible, but I don't remember it. I just remember Gonzaga doing it once, like 40 seconds in, and there being right. a scramble, and it never happening again. Yeah. But Mir is not really, like, the best heavyweight wrestler that you can think of. Oh, I no, mean, no. Mike Russell probably has a better takedown. Well, and, and even Carwin, who, who kind of had that wrestling base, he's never really shown a propensity for it uh, since he, you know, entered the UFC. Um, he, I know he took down, I don't remember if it was Neil Wayne, uh, but it was one of those those bums that he fought in his first couple of fights. He, he took one of them down pretty easily. Is Neil Wayne? What was that? Neil Wayne? Isn't he like an actor, comedian, writer? No, Neil Wayne. Uh, who are you thinking of? I'm 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 thinking Neil, Neil Wayne, the guy who wrote Role Models. Role Models? I have no idea who you're talking about, Ross. Yeah, I'm talking about Neil Wayne from of UFC 89 fame. Yes. Got knocked out with one punch. No, that was Christian Wellett. That was uh, Carwin's highlight one punch knockout. Yeah, I, I believe it was it was Neil Wayne. He took down and then ground and pounded. Uh, yes, and Joe Rogan said you can feel the punch. Yes, that's the the fight he always look, he always alludes to when he talks about Carwin's power. Um, but yeah, I, going back to the the idea of a rematch and what you were saying, um, Eric, and and your rebuttal, Matt, is that uh, you know even if Overeem were to get licensed, um, which I don't think is going to be very tough because uh, I doubt they're going to have him fight in Nevada, uh, his first fight back. Um, but even if he were to get licensed, you know, he would have to go through that at the end of December. Uh, so I don't think they're going to have him fight until, you know, February or March at the earliest. Uh, you know, obviously they're not going to have him try to get a license two weeks or three weeks before a fight. And um, honestly, I think that he has to win a fight before he can – I don't think he comes back to a title shot. I just don't. Well, I mean, that depends. I think I think a lot of that's going to depend on how um, Fabricio Verdum uh, does against Mike Russell. Uh, I think if he wins, um, uh, depending on how they want to handle Dan- Daniel Cormier, uh, he's probably the next in line, uh, assuming Kane gets a rematch here. Um, I, and, I, again, it depends on again, how they want to handle Overeem, too. Um, I know, Derek, just your sense of justice, you probably want Overeem to take a fight in the interim. Um, but I, I could see them giving him the, you know, the shot right away, uh, you know, just because really outside of those top three guys, it's kind of a mishmash, uh, you know, right after them in the rankings. I I just, I think that those three guys give them enough time for Overeem to have a fight when he comes back in February or March and not have a problem because Cormier is going to be out for a little bit. I think he broke his hand in the Barnett fight or he broke something. So he's probably going to have his plus one in strike force towards the end of summer, beginning of fall. And if he does that and comes over to the UFC, he's right there for an end of the year, beginning of next year title shot. So there's enough time to do the tough season, give Cormier his title shot, and have Omri earn his stripes against somebody. Yeah, and and it came out uh, within the last day or two that uh, Kane also broke his hand against Bigfoot Silva. He's 
he's going to be out depending on how uh, the x-rays look uh, up to six months or at least medically suspended. Uh, he can get cleared earlier by a doctor. but Yeah, uh, and I have to give um, Luca Fury from SureDog at Gambling Fury on Twitter credit for this, but like everybody that punches Bigfoot Silva in the head breaks their hand on it. It's like the last five guys that have done it. Yeah, that's. I, I assume that has something to do with the uh, is it acromeliology? Is that how you pronounce uh, his? I, I believe it's acromalgy. Uh, acromalgy. Uh, no, no, you guys are mispronouncing it. It's called having a giant fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> the jack o' lantern jaw itis. Yeah, that one. Um, no, I, I, I apologize. I was thinking of David Wayne, not Neil Wayne. Oh, there you go, Matt. Good, good job That's doing the research, though. Um, but yeah, the, if they, if they, why you guys were talking. If they end up doing the the tough season, uh, you know, it gives it, it'll give Alaska some time to uh, to heal that hand up, because uh, I believe they would probably start that what August maybe or July, uh, and that yeah. runs for 13 weeks. So I mean, that's going to give him a good four to five months just right there. Um, but yeah, uh, running down the rest of the card, if I can find it on Wikipedia. Uh, I have a question because. Oh, we, we we were talking about how you know this is a really really exciting card. Um, what what did you guys think of that CB Dalloway Mayhem Miller fight? I think it sucked. I you know I, I I one thing that was kind of surprised about I, I saw somewhere and it might have been Bloody Elbow, um, but the headline read something like CB Dalloway uh, barely decisions Jason Miller, and you know Dalloway took a couple of shots and you can argue that he lost a round, but. I, you know, for the most part, for the you know for 14 of the 15 minutes of the fight, I thought he just took the fight to Miller and just dominated him. Yeah, I mean, one, I didn't think that was a boring fight. I, I was actually really impressed, and I really enjoyed watching the grappling, um, which is basically what the entire thing was. I, I, Miller, he he landed some nice shots, but if you, I, I don't know, man, I, I wasn't impressed by Mayhem at all. I didn't like Joe Rogan harping on him maybe having a blown out knee while he's like standing up and putting weight on it and using it to turn on punches. Like if you have a blown out knee, you can't do that. And Joe's blown his knee out a couple of times, so we should know that. Well, and, the, and there's also the thing. There's also the thing too that if he actually blew out his knee, he probably would be. I mean, he probably wouldn't have lasted as long as he did. I mean, he, if you blow out your knee, it's a pretty. I mean, usually you're writhing in pain. Yeah, that's yeah, he hurt you. You don't get up, and you know you don't you don't get up and start walking around. Yeah, I mean, uh, said, if you just watch you know, the the NBA playoffs earlier this year when when Derrick Rose blew his knee out, and, and obviously he was jumping around, and that adds to something to it too. But I mean, he laid on the floor; he he had no intention of of even standing up, and he had he didn't have to worry about someone putting yeah. weight on him or someone punching. Yeah, he wasn't him. pushing off on anybody's hips or anything like yeah. that. I mean, Mayhem was fucking moving around on the ground. He wasn't doing anything, because I guess Dalloway is a superior wrestler, which surprised me a little bit. But Mayhem looked like shit, and his inability to escape a position that was clearly losing him the fight for, like you said, 13 or 14 minutes out of the 15, I'm okay if I never see him fight again. You, 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 were, you were surprised that a... All American out wrestled Mayhem Miller. I thought Mayhem had decent enough ground shots where he could at least scramble and improve his position to the point of standing after a takedown. But there was just none of that. Man, I guess C- CB Dalloway controlling the ankle that was amazing. Um, I don't know, man. I, I was really impressed by CB Dalloway's wrestling. Because when was the last time we actually saw him purely wrestle somebody down and just wrestle the shit out of them? Well, yeah. He, he, yeah, that's true. Well, his opponents, you know, recently had like he tried to do that against Mark Munoz, and Mark Munoz knocked his fucking head off. So, and if I remember correctly, um, you know, I wasn't paying super close attention to the fight after the you know the first couple of rounds. But if I remember correctly, it wasn't like Dolly sat in guard and just held him down. I mean, he was he was improving position when he could. He was you know he, he was he, he, he was, was never down. really in guard. It was more like kind of like side turtle position with a bear hug on him and nobody really doing anything. I mean, he couldn't advance. Mayhem was doing a good enough job to keep him from mount most of the time or from taking the back. But Dolly was content to just sit there and land little pot shots. Yeah, and I think. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I, I, I just think that, you know, the, the high half guard, is, as I at least like to think of it, um, it may, Bollway was really impressive by using the high half guard, which is, like, close to side control, because um, Mayhem was on, like, one of his hips. I, I, I was just really, really impressed by, by uh, C.D. Um and, and, and Mayhem Miller looked like shit, for real. Yeah. He looked like... 
Yeah, I, I think the the biggest uh, I think the biggest surprise in the, in considering the names at the top of the card, I think it's kind of gone under the radar a little bit. But the Jamie Varner's victory over Edson Barboza really took me for surprise. And and it wasn't you know a lot of times when a when an underdog comes in like that, there's something fluky that happens. You know, there's a a quick knockout or or a, you know a punch and a scramble that kind of changes the complexion of the fight. But I thought Varner really did a great job. He had a great strategy. He, uh, you know, he took it to Barboza and, and really made him to defend the takedown. And then when he had him backpedaling, he threw punches and, and really just dominated him from, you know, for the three minutes of the fight. Yeah, yeah, not just punches, bombs. Like, he knew his two advantages there were going to be his wrestling and his power. And, and a lot of people wouldn't have bought the power argument, but he said, look, you know, I'm a wrestler. I got shoulders. I'm big for 155. I can throw some weight behind these and at least back somebody up if they just want to put a hand up and think that's going to stop it. So... By just combining those two and being super aggressive and eating like one or two of those leg kicks and saying, I don't want to do this anymore, it was almost like a Bo Shokami kind of situation. He wasn't getting his ass beat at any point, but when he he knew that you know a decision isn't going to go my way unless I could really get on this guy, so his aggression from the get-go kind of made the difference and really probably talent level because Barbosa is probably a better fighter overall. Yeah, and the crazy thing about uh, Jamie, too, is that if you look at his record um, – if you go back, his last before Barboza, his, his last big victory was over Donald Cerrone uh, in January of 2009. Um, and you look at the victories he had in between. He lost four four fights, and he, he drew another uh, in between here. But you look at these. You look at his victories: Tyler Combs in Extreme Fighting Organization, Nate Jolly in XFC, and Drew Fickett with his last fight in XFC uh, in February. Uh, and then he that includes a loss uh, in between those fights to Dakota Cochran, which who I believe was the the infamous gay porn star. Uh, yep. Turned MMA fighter. Um, Why is that infamous, man? What do you got against gay porn stars? Yeah, but, but also, but also, Varner, Varner was like a, a legitimate favorite going into that fight against uh, Cochran. Oh yeah, well, I see that it's a 165 catch weight. I don't know if if Cochran was a a welterweight coming down and and Jamie was was fighting up in weight. Um, well, obviously he was fighting up in weight just because he's a 155er. But I don't know if. If Cochran was just a bigger guy, I and mean, that's what ha- I, I obviously haven't seen the fight. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was on Titan Fighting Championship, so. I saw it. I mean, I, it, he um, the, the way that they were talking about it going into the fight was it, it seemed like uh, Newton and uh, HD Net were at least trying to sell um, Jamie Bonner as the favorite. Dakota Cochran that was like his first big win of his career. Uh, yeah, and, and Jamie Jamie Varner, he, he he he's hit some really really low times. Hopefully the the Barboza fight is is, is a good thing for him. Um, I, I think during my play by play, I wrote something like that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> but, no, but but that's but that, that, that's that's right because no, yeah, you, you know they they want they wanted to get Barboza in the title picture eventually, and <laughs> losing to Jamie Varner the way that he did, that. Uh, that's like ten steps backwards. Yeah, and I look at, I'm looking at Cochran's record. He has he has two fights since he beat Varner. Uh, he lost, and and neither of these guys have Wikipedia pages, uh, which gives you an indication of of uh, their stature in the in the MMA world. But he lost to a guy named uh, Ramiko Blackman and a guy named Cliff Wright. Um, and the whole reason I brought these these that uh, Varner's record up is is the fact that I think people and and rightfully so kind of wrote him off uh, in this fight. Uh, there was I had no reason to believe that he could even mount uh, much of, of any offense against Barboza, and he went out and really just uh, looked really, really good. Um, not sure if that's something he can sustain in the UFC, but uh, it definitely, like you said, Matt, it, it took it. It really takes the wind out of uh, Barboza's sails in terms of uh, a title shot. Yeah, I mean, I mean losing losing to like Jim Miller losing to. Uh... I guess that's a, that's a bad example, but you know, Clay Guida losing to Ben Henderson. That's that's not as bad as you know Edson Barboza losing to Jamie Varner. You know, Guida can beat Maynard um, at the end of June, and he could be right back in the in the, in the title in the title picture. You know, Bar- Barboza is going to have to fight somebody like Jacob Volkman. Or or Efrain Escudero. I don't know. That's I don't what know he, he. That's what he should have been doing anyway. Do you guys hear yourselves? We're talking about Ezevaz Boros as a possible title contender if he would have beaten Jamie Varner after beating Terry Edom. Like I understand it was a really cool hook kick that he landed on him. It was awesome. It was fantastic. But 
lightweight stacked, and this might be a good thing for Barbosa because now he's going to fight guys that are on his level instead of being accelerated way too fucking quickly. Well, that, I think that's the, the issue, though. I, I don't think he was on track for a title shot after he beat Varner, just the sense that, you know, he beats Varner, he beats two or three guys as he, you know, moves up in the, the, the echelons of the division. And, you know, in a year or two, he's fighting for the title. This really well, sense of He's back. still kind of there. I mean, if he fights, like, Joe Lozon next, and then he fights the loser, one of these big fights that's happening, maybe, like, Clay Guida after Maynard gets done with him, and then one more guy, he's still in that trajectory. This loss doesn't really set him back that far. I don't know, dude. I, he, lost to a guy, he lost to a guy that was a 5-1 to one underdog and no one had any expectations for. Hey, these things happen in MMA. But at this point in his career, would you feel comfortable putting him in Against, like, Melvin Gillard? I'm comfortable as in I think he could win, sure. Melvin Gillard is a very mercurial character. If you have, like, two submissions and a takedown, you can probably be Melvin Gillard. I, I don't know, man. I mean, like, it, it, it seems like you you may be under underrating uh, Barboza as well. I, I think that Barboza, had he gotten past Varner and maybe... I just Warner think it's too early to tell. Like, what's Barboza's best win? Is it Terry Adam? Yeah, I guess. Okay, then he needs better wins before I think about him as a title contender. Okay. And I gave Roth enough time to respond, and he's he's going to. I felt well, like I did to too. I'm being polite. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're you're not wrong. It's just like the way the way that that they were trying to build Barboza up. I guess is the point I'm trying to make. The way that they're trying to build him up was to, uh, you know, groom him for a title shot. That's how they were trying to build him. And the point I'm trying to make is that lo- losing the way he did to a, such an unheralded opponent, that that's what really is going to set him back. You know, who, who knows if he's going to be the same risk taker that he was. Is he going to have the same dynamic style, or is he going to try and play safer because he don't, doesn't want to lose the same way again? I Maybe he'll be that, more that, aggressive. I mean, he could go the other way. He just kind of fired leg kicks at Varner. Didn't really like get crazy with his hands. Maybe he comes out next time and tries to blitz. Yeah, but that never happens. No, it doesn't. But with his camp, I mean, some fucking coaches are dumb. They might say, "See what happens when you're a pussy." Like some coaches think that way. I don't know, man. I I I, th- I think that it's. It's, it's up in the air, man. Let's just, let's just watch Edson Barbosa develop and get better and fight guys that are more his speed instead of seeing if he can be the John Jones of lightweight. Because there ain't going to be that guy at every fucking division that's 24 and can play with the big boys. Well, I, I, find it, I find it interesting that you're talking about not having him accelerated when he was fighting Jamie Varner in like his fifth well, or sixth year. Jamie UFC Varner fight. was an injury replacement, A. A short term, like a short notice injury replacement. I re- I'm trying to remember who he was supposed to fight, but it was a guy better than Varner. Evan Dunham. Oh, yeah that's, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that's a quality fight between two up-and-coming lightweights. And Evan Dunham is another guy that got accelerated too fucking quickly after he beat Tyson Griffin in an upset. And then he also went on to beat Sean Shirk, which wasn't right. Sean Shirk won that fight, and then Melvin Gillard <laughs> took his soul. <laughs> uh, I, I want to move on to uh, the, the card coming up on, on, on Friday or tomorrow. Uh, I do want to address Jason Amati is... Uh, going back and forth with uh, you, Derek. Um, and you. He's talking shit on oh, you, too. Like, he can't believe anyone's questioning the legitimacy of Mayhem's knee injury. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, I think I just want to clarify that. I don't think that... No, Rogan said it was blown out. Yeah, the difference... Blown out means it's fucking blown out. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Like, I, he, he may or may not have injured his knee. I, I wasn't really in the best uh, condition to judge something like that. But to claim a guy blew out his knee just because he... It might have buckled a little bit. Uh, you know, that's taking a diagnosis a little too far. Um, and that's just my opinion. I mean, I don't think uh, – again, if the guy blew out his knee, it's unlikely he's going to last uh, through three rounds. Um, but we'll move on. Uh, this this tough finale card on Friday, tomorrow, I, uh, I'm i looking – I really like the main event. Uh, Ellenberg, Ellenberger Campman is a, is a really, really top – Top-notch free main event. Uh, I really like Brookins and Oliveira. And speaking of guys, uh, Charles Oliveira, speaking of guys who probably got uh, accelerated too quickly. Um, yeah. uh, yes, and is now at his proper weight class, which is better for him, too. Yes, uh, but the rest of this card obviously is filled with guys on the show, and I have no clue who any of these guys are. I don't know if either of you have watched the show at all this season. I really haven't. I haven't. I, I, I literally haven't. I, I just I know I'm rooting for the guy with the beard. That's all I got. 
Who's the guy with the beard? Michael Chizay or whatever the hell his name is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, one thing that's that's been an issue, and Brent Brookhouse has kind of hammered this on Twitter, is the idea that these guys, I think they're fighting, this is like their third time fighting in three weeks, um, and normally there's very few commissions that would allow something like that, uh, especially a commission like, like Nevada or, or California or, or New Jersey. Um, yet these guys are, are able to do that. And if I've, if I've heard correctly, there was a pretty big uh, cut or something in the last fight, or it was kind of a war or something. Um, but it, it, I do find it odd that, that the commissions are – what was that, Matt? It was a war. It, 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 the normal procedure is that for, for it, it's either a 15-day or a 30-day um, suspension, just like get your brain and your body back together. That, that's like the minimum usually. Right. Um, and so the, the point I think that, that Brent was making is that, um, you know, getting punched in the head in, in, a, in a fight multiple times, you know, in, in a month, like, that, that, that can't be healthy. I well, well, you have to do that. Th- th- I think the bigger point that he's making too, because someone someone uh, tweeted at him and said, you know, hey, a lot of guys train full contact uh, uh, regularly, you know, throughout a month. But but Brent brought the point up that you know now they're cutting weight three times in in that same time period, and that's not uh, that's not good when you're. I mean, that's not good in general, but that's not good when you're getting punched in the head. No, but short story time. A friend of mine had his fight at the local card that happened the same night as the end of the Strike Force Grand Prix, and I was there. And a few days later, like later in that week, he was offered a uh, short notice fight in Titan uh, next month in Kansas, and he took it. So the the yes, he is going to have to make 145 pounds, and normally he walks around at about 160. But because he knows that fight is coming up in a very short time, he's not going to get as fat between fights as he normally would. So his cut's going to be less extreme because he's not going to have as much to cut. When you have three or four months, you'll allow yourself to get heavier than if you know you don't have that much time. But you said that fight was a month from now or a month from his last fight? A month from his last fight. It will be next month in June. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a little different than than – two or three fights in a two or three week period. Which I think well, is the bigger it, it, issue. Here. Well what is it what, what is they didn't did they have both semifinals two or both quarterfinals two weeks ago and then the semifinals last week? Like what are these guys actually doing? Like is this their third fight in four weeks, third fight in five? What is it? Uh, no, it's, it's their third fight in, in three weeks. They had the uh the quarterfinals, the semifinals and the finals. Oh not tomorrow. But they had both the quarterfinals two weeks ago. They didn't break that up. They had two fights on. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, then, I mean, that's kind of, they're really not, then they're probably just maintaining within five pounds of their weight for that whole week. They're probably dieting the entire time. Well, it's not so much, I mean, if you're going to argue that they're just going to be maintain, like they're just going to be hanging out at the fight weight this whole time well, I'm just, month. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, defending or attacking anything. I'm simply saying that it's not, the, they're not ballooning up to like, you know, their regular 180 pound selves in between these fights like they would for a fight, you know, their regular three fight a year schedule. They don't get as heavy in between as they normally would. That's all I'm saying. I think that's an irrelevant point, but I'll let you make it. Um, they don't cut as much. The cut isn't as bad when you do it that quickly because it's not from as high a point. Yeah, but when you're talking about cutting from a, like, you're walking around weight, you're talking about losing weight during your camp and then making a final cut. I mean, this is basically three final cuts in a row. Unless they're sticking around one whatever weight class this is, 155, unless they're sticking around that, that weight, you know, they're still cutting 5 to 10 pounds before the fight. And three weeks in a row, and that's, you know, draining your head of, of fluid. Like, it's a really bad combination uh, when, you, when you start throwing in strikes to the head. Well, that's, this that's is a very issue. humble concern that you're showing here. If they had a steroid for that, you'd let them have it, so. <laughs> <laughs> you you damn right. You damn right. Can I we was. just shoot? Can we just shoot some fluid into their skull with the roids? Like, can we kill two <laughs> birds with one stone here? This That's is the Doctor Fagan prescription. Well, if, if you find uh, Alistair Overeem's doctor, I'm sure he's willing to uh, mix mix testosterone into whatever drugs you need. Molina's who I went to for my weed prescription. Yeah, That's Molina. Really nice. um, but yeah, let's talk about the main event real quick. Um, uh, Jake Allenberger, ranked number three. Uh, obviously, looking at the the bloody elbow rankings here, uh, Martin Kamen, number nine. Uh, obviously, if Ellenberger wins, he's he's pretty much locked himself into a title shot after Condit and St. Pierre finally meet. Uh, if Kamen wins, does he does he get himself next in line, or is he still behind a guy like Johnny Hendricks? 
I, I don't know if it's a, a guy like Hendricks because at some point Diaz is going to come back, and with how long it's going to take St. Pierre versus Condit, I could definitely see Diaz Ellenberger or Diaz Hendricks for the number one spot whenever that happens towards the end of the year. Matt, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, here's, here's the problem. Um, so Hendricks was, was announced at the UFC on Fox 3 uh, post by Pulser that he was the number one contender. And Hendricks decided that he's going to be waiting out and uh, until he can fight for the title. The problem is, uh, but the problem is that this is also supposedly for a title shot. So um, Carlos Condit is your number one contender because he's the interim champ. Uh, Johnny Hendricks is your number one contender because Dana said so like multiple times during fight week. And uh, Campman or Allen here is also your number one contender. Hmm. Here, here, let, let me get your opinion on this real quick as far as the interim belt, and I heard Helwani bitching about it not being defended. I think defending an interim belt defeats it being an interim belt. It's basically a uh, ticket to a title shot where you unify them. If Condit defends it, do you think they should strip St. Pierre and just say, you're the welterweight champion? Uh, it, it really depends. I, you know, that's that, it's an interesting point because the idea of an interim belt is, you know, that while this champion's out, you have someone – um, kind of carrying the torch, and then when they when the guy comes back, you're able to unify it. Um, the the funny thing is with the way that MMA scheduling works out, especially at the the top top level like that, a champion fights you know two times a year normally, maybe three times if they're you know uh, active. I mean three times is, is pretty active for a champion. Um, so by the time that you even defend uh, an interim belt, usually if the champion is not coming back shortly after that. You probably should strip him anyway. Um, but the well, idea I think of, a year is normally a pretty good rubric, and we're really—I think we just passed that with Saint Pierre since the Shields fight. Okay, so so, so Saint Pierre—they're shooting for him to come back in November, and that's going to be eighteen months. 18 yeah. Months. Like, you, uh, you, dude, at this point, you have to strip him of the title. They did it with Mir. They they did it with Mir, and and that's when uh, Arlovsky became the uh, the undisputed champion. Um, while you know Mir was out from his motorcycle accident, I believe. Right. Um, well, because he, like, he won, yeah, he won the the interim title, and then they they awarded him the the official undisputed title. People can come back and defend it. They, they, that's what they should do with Walter Wade. Clean up the clear out the, the you know clear out the now I guess you know the log jam at the top. Clear it out. Let 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 let's do Condit versus. Hendricks and you know, and then the winner of Campman Ellenberger versus the winner of Condit Hendricks. Sounds awesome to me. That sounds like a great three, three great. So you fights. just you just want a tournament. You want like a four man tourney. No, I'll do, do it because because you know Condit's the champion. Condit's the champion. Let let the number one contenders fight in their number one contending spot. Yeah, and one, one thing that's interesting, or I, I thought kind of funny, was was Mike Chiapetta was talking about having Condit. I don't remember if it was Hendricks or, or Ellenberger, but he wanted Condit to fight one of those guys for the number one contender spot. And I'm like, bro, like Condit's a champ. Like even if even if he's the interim champ, he's still a, the champ right now, and there's no way around that. Sure, there is. It's it's a bullshit paper title. It's like how Shane Carwin was the interim champ, and then all it got him was a title shot against Brock. Like the, when the fight when he fought against Frank, it was for the interim belt. And I don't even think that fight was uh, five rounds, was it? Mere Carwin. Yeah. No, it was five rounds. Okay, okay. So it was, but and that's really the main difference that the interim belt makes that Diaz Condit was five rounds, but it probably would have been anyway because it was a main event. Uh, Campman Ellenberger is going to be five rounds, which I think helps Campman because a lot of times he seems to run out of time more than lose fights. But so are, are, are you saying that you wouldn't call Shane Carwin a former UFC champion? It, it interim. He's a former interim UFC champion. And I know that Trevor Whitman's going to be pissed off and say that that's not true. And he was given a belt, but it, it's an interim belt. It is what it is. They, they don't strip the champion, then you're, you're kind of the champ until the champ gets back. <laughs> <laughs> the champ until the champ gets back. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting that um, at this point, like you said, uh, St. Pierre's last fight was the Shields fight back in uh, April 30th of, of 2011. Uh, so we're a full 13 months past that, and if he's not going to fight until November... Um, well, the earliest. That's the earliest he's going to come back. Right. Um, which always seemed... I mean that's that's an aggressive uh, recovery time for for the injury that he had. 
Um, but it just seems yeah, like, he didn't blow his knee out 13 months ago. He blew his knee out like five months ago, six months ago. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, it's just thing to me that they're they're gonna. To me, if I'm in the UFC, I would just award Condit the title. You know, have him fight in the interim because if you, I think if you give him the full title, he's more willing to take a fight in between um, now and November if if St. Pierre's ready. Because what and what happens if if you know. George has a setback now. Like, you know, what if we get to August or September and there's a setback? You know, that now you have Condit waiting almost a year. That's probably no. That's probably what they're waiting for. If there is a setback in August and September, they probably just say, "Okay, Condit's the champ. Here's his next fight." Yeah, I mean, that's. It just seems odd. You know, you know, you know, St. Pierre's going to be out for this long at a minimum. You know, why not just give Condit uh, the the full the full treatment? I think it, part of its loyalty to GSP, part of it is wanting to keep the Canadian fan base happy in the hopes of having a big pay-per-view there to kind of close out what's been a pretty shitty year thus far as far as the numbers go. I think that, you know, George St. Pierre is one of their biggest stars, and they want to see if they can bring him back relatively unscathed and give him a fight he can win. If they can do that, then that's what they're going to do. If they can't, then they'll explore other options. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that fight, too. I mean, I think Connett's, uh, Connett's going to be a tough matchup for anyone at welterweight, but... Um... You know, coming off of a knee injury like that, it's gonna be really interesting to see how George reacts to it, how he feel, you know, how comfortable he's gonna feel on that knee. Because um, I, I, you know, I think it's a serious fight that that he could lose if if he's not totally 100 uh, percent confident in his ability to 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 drive, which is his biggest skill in MMA. Sure, well, no, it's, and Condit has yeah. an ability to scramble even after a takedown. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. I mean, GSP's biggest skill is is his double leg, right? I mean, his ability to explode across the cage. Like, a, a, a knee injury, who even knows if we're going to see GSP? You know, he, he could be a shell of his former self. Um, I, I, I like Condit when they actually eventually fight because of just that reason. Well, and, and plus, like like we've talked about, I mean, just 18 months out of the sport, you know, we've seen so many guys come back from other injuries being out that long and you know getting this is the this is kind of the reason why I I I'm disappointed that they just haven't awarded kind of the title is because if you force GSP to come back after 18 months regardless of what the injury is um you're throwing him right into the deep end um you know this is the kind of situation where I like to see a guy take a a, a tune-up fight um just just so he knows for sure that he's going to be comfortable on that knee that he's going to be able to give 100% uh, uh, champ, his champions don't get two and up fights. Well, that's the thing I'm saying. You strip him, he's not the champ anymore. Oh, so you'd like George St. Pierre to be stripped of it so he can come back and have an easy one before he fights for the belt. I mean, that's oh, not the... But, I mean, maybe maybe a fight with, you know, the, the loser of Camden Ellenberger or something like that. Yeah, or, or you know, depending on what happens with Nick Diaz, you have him fight Diaz. Uh, you could have him fight... <laughs> You could you could have him fight Fitch again. You could have him fight you know not Koscheck, but um, you know there's guys at welterweight. You could have him fight Diego Sanchez. I mean, there's a lot of good fights at welterweight. That'd be awesome and mean at the same time. I would pay to see that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good fights at welterweight that don't involve just throwing an entire scrub in there. I mean, there's a lot of quality bodies at at 170. Yeah, I mean, there there are options there, but like if George St. Pierre can come back in November and he feels confident enough to take a title fight at that time, then let it be belt versus belt, champion versus champion, unify it and move on. That's fine. I'm sure Condit is enjoying the time off. Maybe. Um, but we'll move on. Uh, UFC 147, a uh, big change to that card. Uh, Vitor Belfort, uh, I don't know if he's broke his hand or fractured his hand, uh, but he's broke out. It. And... Broke it. And Vanderlei Silva is calling him a coward, and now Rich Franklin is stepping in to take a fight at 190 pounds. Uh, it's a rematch of a fight at UFC 99, I believe, uh, that Franklin won a uh, disputed decision. Uh, I thought he won. Uh, other people gave the fight to, to Vanderlei. Um, and the, the the chatter on on Twitter that I've read is pretty much calling this undoubtedly the worst pay per view in the UFC for at least five or six years. I actually wrote those exact words. Those exact words? Those exact words. I said that this is probably the worst pay-per-view in uh, the past five or six years. <laughs> uh, what makes it worse than UFC 108? Dude, it's terrible. Like, 
you, like uh, to me, to me, there's one, there's one fight that interests me on on, on this card, and it's not the main event, and it's not a, the, the tough, uh, the, the tough number, um, the tough finale. I'm interested in seeing Fabrizio Verdum versus Mike Russo, and I'm not spending fifty five dollars to watch Fabrizio Verdum fight Mike Russo. You know, in, in retrospect, uh, and obviously it's difficult to judge in retrospect because uh, we know how these guys have played out since then. But in retrospect, this card is the UFC 108 wasn't that bad. Uh, the the main event was, I mean, people still didn't buy Rashad Evans as a as a legit main eventer by himself. Uh, so throwing Thiago Silva in there with him is, I think, was the biggest uh, you know uh, mark against it. But uh, if you just go down this whole card, you got Evans, Thiago Silva in the main event, Dustin Hazlett, Paul Daly at uh, in the co-main, uh, which is also a, a pretty weak co-main. Uh, but then you got Joe Lozon, Sam Stout, Jim Miller, Dwayne Ludwig, and Junior, uh, a guy named Junior Dos Santos against Gilbert Ivel. And then in the prelims, you got Campman versus Volkman, Cole Miller, Dan Lozon, Mark Munoz, Ryan Jensen, Mike Pyle, Jake Ellenberger, and Rafael Oliveira versus uh, John Gunderson. Like, that's not a bad card top to bottom. It turned out to be really awesome, but all, not all those guys that you named that turned out to be really good, like, they weren't really ranked going into that card. So rankings-wise, and this card also isn't filled out, the one that's going to be uh, Vandalay versus Rich Franklin, too, which was a good fight the first time around. I kind of favor Vandalay in the rematch because I think Rich has slowed down since then. He's not going to be in as accurate, and Vandalay's kind of settled in at that weight class. It was his first time ever fighting below 2 I think it's going to be a good competitive scrap, and I don't buy a lot of pay-per-views because I'm fucking broke, but I'll definitely watch it at the bar. How about, how about the fact that um, Vitor's, belt, uh, Vitor's wife actually responded um, to, to uh, Anderle Silva? Did you guys hear about that or no? I did not hear about that. I, I actually read a little snippet. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so Vanderlei basically... What, what, what he said is that Vitor um, was disrespectful for breaking his hand um, because <laughs> at the highest levels the fighters have like the best equipment and the best training available, so there's um, there's no reason to have any significant injuries. That's uh, that's what Van Hill said. Um, obviously, he said it differently, but that's basically the premise. Um, Vitor's wife said the only thing Van Hill can do is talk too much. He chickened out several times on fighting Vitor, and now he comes to try my uh, to talk, my husband is ducking. If you doubt the next opponent, the wand is uh, in 147 will beat the record of 40 seconds of Vitor Belfort or Chris Levin 20 seconds. Uh-uh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a quality ending. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I, I think that this is the best case because I think that the Vanderlei was going to get murdered by Franklin, or you were saying if he fought Belfort, he would have gotten murdered. If he fought Buffalo, like that would have been ugly. Yeah, and the other interesting thing about this fight, um, and I tweet, tweeted about this a couple of days ago, uh, the, the line opened up with uh, Franklin as a plus one fifteen underdog, and, and and I'm not sure why. I mean, obviously he's coming in on a on short notice a little bit here, although he was preparing for a fight next month. Um, you know, he he was gonna fight at one eighty five, so it shouldn't the weight shouldn't be too big of an issue for him. Uh, he might have to accelerate his uh, his diet here, but. Um, uh, you know, he beat Vanderlei the first time. I don't think Vanderlei has gotten better necessarily since then. So I, I just, I have a hard time uh, seeing how Silva beats Franklin the second go round. Is it Rich kind of looked like shit against Forrest Griffin? And I know that Forrest is a bigger version of Rich Franklin and younger, but I, I just think that Rich has lost a little bit of that speed that I think made the difference in the first fight. And and the line, uh, it's only open at one one sports book, but the line's already moved. Uh, Franklin is is now uh, at even, and Silva is still the favorite at minus one thirty. Um, yeah, but, but but also Franklin hasn't fought since February two thousand eleven. And that's when Forrest beat his ass, right? Yeah, that, that, that's what, that was when uh, when Forrest beat the shit out of him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like Franklin's also going to have a ton of ring rust. That's true. Um, to be honest, I, I completely forgot that uh, this Forrest Griffin fight even happened. I, I have almost no memory of it. Man, I, I, it was it, it was pretty ugly. It looked like a heavyweight versus a light heavyweight. Yeah, but that's what it looked like. I mean, I mean, Rich doesn't really fight all that often anymore. The last time he fought three times in a year was in 2009. Fought once in 2010 against Chuck Liddell when he knocked him out. And then once in 2011 when he got you know, bodied by Forrest. Um, and I think since you know, then he's had shoulder surgery, so he'll be coming back from that as well. 
Yeah, exactly. He he, he had uh, he was out for uh, a tearing of his labrum. <laughs> for some reason, for some reason, what's so funny about that? For some reason, when you said when you said labrum, I thought of labia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're gonna, it's going to be one of those podcasts. Okay. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just think that I, I, I feel more comfortable about uh, Vanderlei Silva beating Rich Franklin than uh, than Vanderlei Silva beating uh, Vitor Belfort. How about uh, how about I'll pose this guy's this question to you guys in in terms of uh, you know an entertaining fight. Uh, are you expecting an entertaining fight, or or is this going to be two two guys past their prime, kind of uh, at, at the, you know at the end of their careers? It'll be fun. It'll be fun to watch. First fight was fun. They both still have heart. I really haven't seen a lot of boring Vandalese. Even made by Michael Bisbing fight fun. That's fucking hard to do. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a fun fight. <clears throat> and he beat <throat> Michael Bisbing. How can he be that done when he's one and one in middleweight with a win over Michael Bisbing? <sighs> I don't know, man. I, 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 <laughs> How I, can no, he be I, done? Answer the question. He, I, I don't think I don't think that he's done, but I think that he, he now needs to be used as basically, you know, the the old horse going out the stud. You know, let him let him. They should sacrifice him to Chris Weidman, is what you're saying? No, no. I I, I think that that either if you if you're not going to give him. Uh, the fights that basically people use is you know use that win to you know get a name, then you have to put them out in like you know really 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 fun fights where you're going to get to see vintage Vanderlei Silva. Yeah, um, and I wasn't giving him enough credit earlier. He's two and one in middleweight. I forgot him beating the piss out of Kung Lee. Yeah, yeah I mean at the same at the same time he also you know got hit in the head a bunch in the first couple minutes of that fight. And he ate him, and he was okay. It wasn't like when when Chris Levin knocked him out, people said, oh, he can't take a punch anymore. He needs to retire. He took a lot of punches from Kung Lee. He was okay. Yeah, but he, but, but he can't take a punch anymore. He took him. He died, but he'd take a punch better than you, Roth. You go seven minutes with Kung Lee, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking bloggers talking shit. Uh, with, with with that uh, with that we'll transition into the the next topic of conversation here. Uh, and Matt, you you were kind of harping on this with, with John Snowden today. Uh, you know, Loretta Hunt of Sports Illustrated released the names of the women that John Jones was uh, traveling with. When no, he they're not them. women; they're girls. Just check Bloody Elbow's headlines. Yes, according to Bloody Elbow headline, they're twenty five year old girls. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Matt, you you had an issue with it. Yeah, I, I, my issue. Look, I, I get that that you want to get the the story, but um, th- there's no reason to put these girls' names out there or these women, whatever you want to say, these broads' names. Um, <laughs> they did nothing so, wrong. Like, so yeah, they, they, they literally they were riding in a car with somebody, and that person um, hit hit a, uh, a a pole. There's no need to put their names out there. If the story that you're trying to get is was his fiance one of them? Then the way that you could have, that you could write it is uh, the police confirmed that his fiance was not one of the passengers. Boom, well, perfect. I mean, it, 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 even if you want to make it juicier, you can still say that they're you know twenty five year old women and that aren't his wife. Or you could just not fucking mention it because it has nothing to do with the story, and it just adds spice. It's TMZ bullshit. These women did nothing wrong. Now there's pictures of them out there. People are Googling them, putting it up. It's a high school friend of one of his, so unless he was planning on fucking both of them, I really don't see what the angle is here. I, I, yeah. I like you keep bringing that up, Matt, or Derek, because he definitely could have been trying to bang both of them. And well, good on him for doing so. That's whatever, though. That, that, that's whatever, though. Like he, he, Again, it really goes back to the fact that Look, these these women didn't do anything wrong, you know. And for all we know, and as unlikely as this possibility actually is, he could have just been picking them up. Like he he was the guy that you know they, they asked for a ride home, and he said hey, no problem. For all could have been know, the soberest one in the car. We've all been there. Like, hey, who's the least drunk? Right. I mean, like we have no idea what the context was. We have no idea, and and the story that was basically painted by, by Loretta and what basically everybody else is like everybody else has picked up the story and writing about these girls, you know, these, these women are all trying to paint the same picture of, um, infidelity. And, and I just think that, but again, there's no reason to, to, to put these, you know, their names out there. There's no reason 
to pursue this story. If you wanted to, to say this, you know, that, that, that his, that his fiancé, you know, wasn't one of them, you say, you know, that the police uh, were un, didn't, didn't continue their identities but said that one of them wasn't, uh, wasn't the fiancé. Like, you could do that. There's no problem with that. Um, I, I just don't like creating a story that may not be a story. With that said, though, John Jones sure likes his white women, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, good for him. No, good for him. Because, you know, we're wearing bad looking, man. So, so nice, good for him. Yeah, Matt, you found, uh, you sent me a couple of pictures of them, and they were, they, they were cute. Yeah, that's good, good for him. <laughs> Anything else you want to say about this before we move on here? No, nah, no. Nah. Some, some more scandal in the UFC? Absolutely yeah, let's not. Go, let's, go to the, let's go to the next scandal. Yeah, this one's a lot more fun. Uh, Ariane Celeste, domestic assault. Oh, <laughs> I, for Christ's sake! <laughs> I'm I knew gonna you were fucking. God. It, it, it. This is just. This I, was I, not I, on the dais. It, oh, it's on the dais, my friend. It's on. It's on my docket right here. Uh, oh. the, the funny. The funny thing about this story is that it looks like, and I don't want to get too deep into it. I don't really care, but it, it looks like one of those stories that both people are probably at fault, and both people look like idiots. Yeah, so, so so do you know the details or any other details or no? I, I've heard there was something about uh, her boyfriend. Uh, what's her, what's his name? Chandra something? Um, yeah, it's, not, it's, he, Chandra. it's like Prezac right. or something. Um, but he, I, I I heard that he showed up on like a set of a music video that she was supposed to be in, and they got all jealous. Uh, and then I've heard conflicting stories about you know who hit who first. Um, you know I, he claims that she kicked him in the face in a limo. And then uh, she claims that he choked him a couple times, or she he choked her a couple times. Um, but uh, but I also heard that she was whining about him not paying bills for her and stuff. So it, it sounds like everyone involved probably is an idiot here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I believe it was Neil Manish that said that you know at least regarding her um, her, her uh, police photo, I, I can't think of the name. Right now, the the the, fo- the the photo from from the police station. The mugshot. Um, the mugshot. The mugshot. She looks like a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely wasn't her finest moment. <laughs> She'd been crying, guys. Show us some goddamn sympathy. <laughs> no, the, the other the other great thing is this happened. You know, whenever it happened at night, because her last tweet when it like uh, was it two in the morning when she said. Uh, I'd be going cray cray, ha ha hee hee. Yeah. And then, and then she got arrested. And then, as of 10 p.m. Las Vegas time, um, she was still in jail on three thousand dollars bond, which actually costs you three hundred dollars because you just got to put down ten percent. So she couldn't find somebody to give her three hundred bucks. I did not have 300 bucks. When I got pulled in, they had an ATM in, like, the waiting room of the jail. You could go over and get money out and pay your bail. That's what I did. Yeah, that's actually a little – I mean, if she's got money issues, if she's relying on this guy to pay bills for her and she can't scrounge up $300, I mean, not that I uh, – Oh, God. I, I look forward to the outside the lines piece by fucking Josh Gross <laughs> about ring girl paying the UFC. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Kill me now. <laughs> I mean, dude, they, they can't get sponsors, and I don't think that they get of the night bonuses, do they? They're not unionized. I mean, fuck, we need we need legislation. <laughs> we need the Ali Act for Ring Girls. What, what do you guys think? What, what do you guys think about them bringing her onto the show? I mean, probably minutes after she got released from from jail. That seemed a little awesome. odd to me. That's fantastic to me. I wish I had ever had an employer that had that kind of faith in me. It'd be fantastic. Matt, any opinion on that? Not really. I mean, I think it was. I thought it was really funny. Uh, you know, like she couldn't even get like her brain back together. It was like, hey, you gotta still work. And uh, hey, remember that time that you beat up your boyfriend? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna hold that against you. But what's funny is they cut to her like during the fight. Like it was ten or fifteen seconds into the round, and it was just like, oh, there's Ariane. Well, there was also there was also some weird production thing where like they like cut to her, and it was clearly an accident because they like cut right back to the the fight, but. Yeah, well, I didn't actually see her carry a card all night. That's the only time I saw her. Well, she only got back for the co-main and the main, I think. It was late. I mean, she was there. I mean, she wasn't there for most of the night. Yeah, but you'd think she'd do it for one of the two rounds of the main event, right? You'd think. 
Uh, now, I have a question. When, when the news uh, when the news broke on Twitter, did any of you guys just think poor Tiki? Poor Tiki? Yeah, poor Tiki. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he, he was referring to Tiki Gosen, of yeah. course. It was, he, he wasn't out. It was a cut. It was a cut. He wasn't out. <laughs> Next person to make that now he's 0-5 in the UFC joke gets fucking kicked off my Twitter feed. That's all I'm saying. I might have to make that joke right now. I uh, hate you. Uh, we'll, we'll move on, though. Uh, we, we successfully got through an hour here, guys. I'm, I'm surprised at how well this is going. Um, and we have 30 more minutes before Blog Talk kicks us out. Uh, hopefully we'll wrap it up before then. We um, ain't filling it. We ain't filling it. That's what she said. Uh, there was a story this week about uh, the UFC paying Nick Diaz a $300,000 bonus to show up for his press conference at uh, whatever UFC 100 Thirty something uh, with Carlos Condit, uh, and I've seen a lot of people make some jokes about, oh, I, I, I wish I had employers that paid me money to not do anything or, or just to show up, and I, I never really understand that reaction because you're not valuable like Nick Diaz is valuable to the UFC. Obviously, well, he's not valuable to him if he doesn't fucking show up to sell himself, is he? Well, if they're willing to pay him just to show up, he's obviously you know valuable in some sense to them. It's I mean, obvious. Well, I don't think they're losing money on him by paying him to go to a press conference. They're thinking by drumming up interest for this fight and you actually showing up to do these things, we're going to make this money back and then some. They look at it as an investment. Not exactly. Here, Nick Diaz. Exactly. He's valuable to them. He 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 will provide. But he's them. more valuable when he shows up. That's the point of this payment. That's the. Point. Yeah. That's the you're making my point. <laughs> but seriously, though, do we really believe that this money was strictly for a press conference? No, I, it sounds like it was also kind of making up for him losing his pay-per-view money from the St. Pierre fight. Yeah, that, that's what it was. I mean, look, I, I really doubt that the UFC is going to be uh, paying you to do something that's required in your contract to do. Well, I mean, they could have they could have offered it to him in the sense of, you know, we'll give you that money you missed out on as long as you show up. And if not, we're going to withhold it. But then it's not paying him to go to the press conferences. That's basically saying, hey, we're, you know... We'll, we'll try and help you back out, you know, cause since you know to give you another shot. I really just don't think that the UFC is the type to hand out 300 Gs to, you know, so you could do something that you're required to do. Because if that's the case, you're going to have how many fighters are on the UFC roster? 250. You know, 200. Yeah, 250. You're going to have 250 fighters saying, "I want 300 Gs to show up to a press conference." Yeah, I mean, obviously, if if people take it that way, um, which was kind of the issue when people, uh, you know, I brought this up too that if you know if you sign Nick Diaz, you have to expect Nick Diaz to act like Nick Diaz, and you know if if he doesn't show up to a presser, that's kind of part of the business of being in in, in business with him. But um, you know that then like, like you said, then you start having other guys uh, demand that that they get the same treatment, and they don't want to show up, or they want extra money to show up. Um, so yeah, but it's still interesting though that. Because I believe Keith Kaiser said that that's the reason he was given as to why Diaz got this money. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure part of it was, hey, let's try and not um, get you know the commission to take some of it. The commission's taking 65k of that. Yeah, what do you think about that? Because that to me that just seems totally outrageous. It's insane. Because that's I mean they took. They took part of his purse and both bonuses he 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 won, if I'm not mistaken. So they're going to make what almost a hundred thousand dollars off of him. Yeah, that's insane. That's absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah, <laughs> like everybody's talking about the UFC maybe paying him three hundred k to you know to go to a press conference. How is the story that the like that's larceny? That's larceny. Yeah, well, then you get people trying to justify it. You know, they're just trying to justify his punishment right after the hearing. You know, it was his second offense, and and he had promised not to do this again to the commission and all this garbage. But I, it's really hard for me to understand how you can take. Uh, and obviously, we're talking about percentages here. But even then, I mean, taking a hundred thousand dollars from him or close to it, it just seems absolutely asinine. Like okay, so. So um, Pacquiao, uh, Pacquiao Bradley is this weekend, right? Yeah. And that's also in Vegas. I believe so. Okay, so, so according to the commission, the way that they handled Nick Diaz, they would be able to also take his, you know, Pacquiao's uh, pay-per-view percentage 
as well as his guarantee if he if he failed a uh, a drug test, which would be like millions and millions of dollars. That's right. fucking insane, dude. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind. I, I would not mind if if they were to you know have a percentage that they take and then a cap of you know thirty thousand know, like, dollars, forty thousand dollars, something like that. <laughs> that's gonna dissuade those boxers. I'm not. I'm not sure it's gonna dissuade them anyway. Um, we got last MMA topic, and then we'll we'll kind of rehash something that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Uh, there was a report, and Silva has kind of downplayed it, but the report that the Anderson Silva injured his knee. Um, you know, some people are questioning how legitimate the injury is. If he's injured, how major? If there is an injury, how major is it? Um, did you guys have any opinion on that? I, I you know, I. I hope he's not injured. I hope he's not. Jonathan Snowden's insinuating that he uh, is giving himself an excuse should he lose to, to Chow. Um, yeah, that's what it sounds like to me, too. Just kind of a preemptive, well, you know, I, I am injured, but we're going to fight anyway. And then coming out and saying you're fine. It's just like the rib injury from last time, like that performance kind of doesn't count by son. And that, it's kind of a preemptive buffer against that criticism if he does look like shit or loses. But did he, did he, I don't, did he talk about the, the rib before the fight? I thought that was something that came out in the post-fight presser and, and in, <clears throat> I believe it's in his, in the documentary, like water. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe that that's documented in that, uh, in that film. Yeah, no, it, it, sure. it, in, in the first fight, he, he didn't mention the rib injury until after, uh, until after the fight. But I, I agree with, with, with Derek and, and, and Snowden. I think that, um, he's prepping himself. Hey, I, I'm, you know, if I lose, it, it's because, you know, I have this injury I'm telling you now, so it's not going to sound like an excuse after the fight. Uh, well, I always, I, I always thought that, or I, I always, I, I, I've also thought that it could just as easily be a smoke screen. It could just be something to kind of give something for Chow to think about, and and maybe you know give him some some false sense of security. That's, I mean, that's possible too. Well then. Uh, Matt, you, you've kind of been uh, harping on this on Twitter the last couple of weeks. Uh, we talked about it a little bit last week with, with Rami Ganauer from Fightmetric, uh, and he said that he wanted a, a little bit of time to think about it, and uh, he sent me an email, uh, and he, he's got a, a little small little dissertation here on uh, the debate on whether a hot, do- a hot dog is a sandwich. And I haven't really – I've only skimmed it, so this is, this is kind of a, a first read for me. Uh, he says uh, – but on to more important things, I think I know why I don't consider the hot dog to be a sandwich. In my opinion, if you have a single whole item that you put in some bread, it wouldn't be a sandwich. The hot dog is a single unit, and the bun is just the wrapper. You could pick up the hot dog with your hand and eat it, too. The same goes for a hamburger or a lobster roll, for example. When you have an Italian sub or a cheesesteak or a grilled cheese, the filling of the sandwich would just be a pile of stuff without the bread. For the moment... I'm ignoring the condiments or veggies that would go on a burger or a hot dog. I'm sure that there is a good example that would break my theory, but it works for me right now. That's Ronnie Gnauer of Fight Metric on a hot dog, whether it's a sandwich or not. I have profiled in the Boston Globe. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. But hey, that, that makes sense. It makes sense, and, you know. Um, I, mean, I mean, whether you disagree or, or agree with it, you, you can't argue that it's not a well-reasoned response. Oh, it's completely well-reasoned. Like, that was amazing. That was yeah. amazing. Oh, and Matt, I, I believe you introduced a new one this week, uh, whether guacamole is a condiment? Yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, That's all it is. It's a dip. It's a condiment. It's not a food. It is a food. It's a food. It's a dip. It's a condiment. You don't eat squawk bully by itself with a spoon, so it's not a food. It's an add-on. Well, here's here's my thing. I I would define I, I would define guacamole as a dip or spread, but I don't necessarily think that that means a a, a condiment. Uh, the 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 definition of the word condiment is a substance such as salt or ketchup that is used to add flavor to food. Okay, well, what would you call? But what would you call? Okay, well, what is guacamole if not like that? I mean, it can be. What is salsa like a food individually by itself, or is it a condiment? Is it a dip? Is it whatever? Yeah, but you you can eat pico de gallo straight. Like you, you can eat that with a fork. But but who would do that? Why not just get a chip and eat the chip with the pico? Because sometimes you don't want chips. 
I eat guacamole with a fork sometimes, man. You're you're a weird dude, Matt. No, according to everybody on Twitter that agreed with me, <laughs> you know, like, guacamole. Well, if, we're, if, if we're gonna use Twitter as our fucking judgment for what's normal, then yeah. we're all fucked. You understand? Yeah. What's that? Because you guys were trying to say that that uh, avocados are for hipsters. No, no, you were trying to say that you would go to like a fucking guacamole bar. Of course I would. That sounds awesome. That's retarded. <laughs> well, would well, you, well, you go to a place that that that, that serves guacamole, like guacamole and, and margaritas? Would you go there? I would. That sounds awesome. Like, ex- like exclusively? Yeah, like like, like, you that, like that's all they have. have? Like, six types of guacs, all made table side, some ceviche, and, you know, I, I would I would go there all the time. I would literally eat there probably four times a week. I would I would literally be more inclined to go to, like, a biscuits and gravy place that had, like, different kinds of biscuits and different kinds of gravy. Yeah, that's insane. A guacamole bar sounds like the most fun ever. But a biscuits <laughs> and gravy is a breakfast, man. Guacamole isn't a fucking meal. <laughs> it is. You're such a retard. So, so here, here's, damn here's a here's a third theory. Uh, I went onto the Wikipedia page for guacamole. In addition to its use in modern Mexican cuisine, it has also become part of American cuisine as a dip, condiment, and salad ingredient. Now, perhaps perhaps things can be used as a condiment, but also as a dip. Maybe you can cross boundaries there. Sure. Sure, no, if you want to make, like, one a, a, a blank burger, like a New Mexico burger, people have different names for it, you just fucking put a bunch of guacamole on the burger, and then that's what it is. But in that case, it is a condiment, much like mayonnaise or mustard. It's not, no, because it turns into a guacamole burger. Like, you wouldn't call it like a mayo burger, would you? No, but it, but it's, a, it's not always a guacamole burger. You can be called a New Mexico burger. I've already called it an Austin burger before. You should know something about that. Dude, I'm I'm saying, look, it's a food. It, it's, it's, not, it's, 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 whole, it's not a meal. It's not a standalone. You don't have a bowl of it that you just eat with a spoon unless you're Some weird. Some people do that. Some people do that. Some people are weird. No, it's delicious. <laughs> I got a tweet from uh, Flat Earth, and Earth is spelled with a three instead of an E and A. Uh, he says it's nice to listen to the podcast live with no audio dropouts. And I guess if you're not considering Derek dropping from the show a couple times uh, without you guys no- noticing, no, no, gives you shit about me. It's like it's been smooth because I fucking wasn't here for a while, so that was awesome. <laughs> I'm glad the listeners are paying attention here and loving what we're laying down. Playing fucking fantastic. <laughs> Uh, but I think that's gonna wrap it up for us, boys. Uh, is there any any final words from uh, from either of you? Yeah, guacamole is a food. Derek, uh, <clears throat> leave these poor girls alone, Loretta Hunt. What the hell's wrong with you? All right, you guys stay on the line, uh, and we'll all see you next week. <laughs>